Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Dairobi Health Show. I'm here with Paul Shapiro of The Better Meat Company. Paul, thank you for coming on the show. Dave, great to be with you. Thanks so much. I've been looking forward to this because you are creating a buzz and a lot of people are talking about the concept that you're doing and, and are interested in it. And I'm really excited to dive in. But first of all, I'm going to read your bio here real quick and then we'll just jump in. For those of you that don't know who Paul Shapiro is or the Better Meat Company, he's the author of the national bestseller, Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner and the World. He is the CEO of the Better Meat Company. He's a four-time TEDx speaker and the host of the Business for Good podcast. He is a longtime leader and advocate in the food sustainability movement. And Paul, uh, there's more to your bio, and I'm just going to stop right there because that's a lot already. <laughs> <laughs> and and so welcome to the show and and let's get the backstory here. How on earth did you uh, arrive at, at this point of being the CEO of the Better Meat Company? How did this all evolve for you personally? Sure, Dave. Well, I'm psyched to be talking with you. And there's one thing that everybody seems to agree on, which is that the planet just isn't getting bigger, right? So uh, right. humanity's footprint on the planet is getting a lot bigger, but the planet itself is not getting much bigger. And one of the primary ways that we leave that footprint is through our food print, principally in the amount of meat that we eat. It just takes a lot of land, a lot of water, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and more to raise and slaughter billions and billions of animals for food. However, just in the same way that we are getting better at producing energy without fossil fuels, we are getting better at producing meat without animals. And so I would put it like this, Dave, you, know, you walk in a room, you flip on a light switch, right? You want light. What you want is the experience of an illuminated room, but you don't really care so much whether it's coming from coal or wind or oil or, or uh, solar. You, you just want light. You want the experience yeah. of a lit room. And the same is so when people eat meat. Most of the time when people eat meat, they're not thinking, ah, oh, I'm so glad an animal was slaughtered for this. If anything, if they think about that, right. they actually prefer that an animal not be slaughtered for it. But Meat consumption is very popular. People really like it. And so the question is, how can we ensure that we can satisfy humanity's meat tooth, so to speak, without the need to destroy the planet and raise and slaughter animals in the process? Because we're not going to be farming the moon. We're not going to be farming Mars. We have one celestial body to farm, and there's more and more humans on the planet every single day. So how can we satiate humanity's meat tooth again? I think that if we divorce meat production from the raising and slaughtering of animals, that we as a species and as a planet, we're going to be a lot better off. And that's why I wrote the book, Clean Meat. And that's why I started the, the Better Meat Co. to help advance animal-free protein technologies. You're, you're solving the omnivore's dilemma. <laughs> we don't want there to be a dilemma. We want there to be a win-win where people can enjoy all the meat that they want to eat without the need to cause so much harm in the process. Yeah, and I'm I'm just gonna put this right out there, and 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 not as a negative. I'm sure it's something you hear all the time. But I'm, I was having this conversation at Sunday dinner. We had a lunch, a, a lot of people around the table. We've got married children and grandchildren, you know. So we have we can get quite a few people for a Sunday dinner and some lively conversation going. And I told them about this concept, and I was pretty excited about it. I think it's pretty cool. But the initial reaction, the knee jerk reaction, uh, that I, and you must hear it. So this is why I want to throw it out there. Is some people go, oh, that sounds gross. And to me, that, that's really weird because I think, you know, and this is, what I, this is what was my answer. I was like, really? Because imagine in 50 years when we're telling people how we used to do it. Don't you think that the raising and slaughtering of animals will sound gross compared yeah. to raising clean meat? Yeah, Dave, Dave, you're but so right. That you must hear this. It must be a concern. It's a new movement and, and people yeah. it takes a while for people to get used to new things. That's exactly right. Look, some people have what's called neophobia, meaning like a fear of new things, right? But I think you're hitting the nail on the head, Dave. So think about it like this. Most people don't really want to know how meat is produced today. But I'm not even going to give graphic detail about how it's produced. I'm just going to tell you one quick story. Think about chickens, right? We raise billions and billions and billions of chickens for food right now. And nearly all of them have been genetically selected to grow so big, so fast, that many of them can't even take more than a single step before collapsing, right? A lot of them are collapsing after just a few steps in their living wing to wing by the tens of thousands inside of windowless warehouses where they're living in their own feces, which are basically 
amplification uh, environments for pandemic risk. And this is how we make chicken today. And then when it's time to take these birds out of the factories in which they're raised and bring them to slaughter, most people don't want to hear about what happens next. And so that's just like the briefest, most benign way to describe how we raise chickens for food today, which is very unsavory. And so when you contemplate just how unnatural and inhumane our current methods of meat production are, I think that growing meat without animals sounds actually naturally preferable to the way that we do it today. But I'll say this, Dave, go back 150 years. The only way anybody back then had to get ice was out of nature, right? So you had a whole right. industry where people were harvesting big blocks of ice out of frozen lakes and frozen rivers, and they put them on insulated boats, and they travel all around the world to deliver ice for people's in-home ice boxes. Well, enter the advent of industrial refrigeration. And all of a sudden, you had a new way to get ice. Rather than getting it from nature, we were getting it from human-made technology. And the ice barons of that age, and it was a big industry, there were barons, the ice right. barons, they right. railed against what they called artificial ice or what people might today call Franken ice. And they said it was unnatural. It went against God and that nobody had ever done this before. You shouldn't give it to your kids. It was unsafe. Well, you yeah, fast forward true. to today. Everybody has an artificial ice maker in their home now. We call them freezers. We don't think there's anything unnatural about it at all, even though it's made by technology rather than being made by nature. Similarly, for just thousands of years, in the same way we only had to get ice was out of nature, we've only had one way to get meat, which was out of animals' bodies. Now, humans are inventing technology that allows us to recreate the meat experience without the need to cause so much suffering and so much environmental damage. And why shouldn't we embrace this technology, which really can help reduce humanity's footprint on the planet to alleviate some of the greenhouse gas emissions that we are putting out, to prevent animal suffering, to reduce the risk to us of future pandemics? You know, Dave, the United Nations put out a report not that long ago. It's called Preventing the Next Pandemic. Preventing the Next Pandemic. And they listed the top ways they think we are going to have another pandemic, the top reasons that we will have another pandemic. Number one on the UN's list was increasing demand for animal protein. Number two was intensification of agriculture, meaning combining animals in smaller and smaller spaces. And number three was the bushmeat trade, meaning killing wildlife for their meat. So according to the United Nations, the top one, two, and three reasons that we may have another pandemic all relate to humanity's desire to eat meat. Now, it would be awesome. It would be awesome if people would look at this and say, ah, you know, I'm happy to eat bean and rice burritos. I'm happy to eat lentil soup and hummus. That's great. I, I love those foods. I wish more people would eat them. That would be fantastic. But yeah. humans, se humans seem to want meat. And so to the extent that we're going to continue eating meat, I think we need to find ways to produce it without animals, just in the same way that we don't like living in the dark. We want lights on. And so we got to find ways to produce that without fossil fuels. When did the, uh, the, the this industry uh, start? What, what was the early days of this industry sure. that you are now in? Uh, sure. So it's really an interesting story, Dave. If you think about the effort to recreate meat without animals, you go over a thousand years ago, there are written records huh. of of plant-based meat recipes in ancient China. The Chinese were the first people to try to recreate meat without animals because they had a large Buddhist population and they weren't eating meat. So they, uh, they needed some type of a meat replacement. And you fast forward to the 19th century here in the US and you had pioneers like John Harvey Kellogg, yes, of Kellogg's, who uh, were marketing their own plant-based meats. In fact, the very first patent ever on a plant-based meat was in 1899 by John Harvey Kellogg. Wow. Um, then, you, then you fast forward, let's say to like the 1980s, and you all of a sudden have brands like Light Life and Tofurky, which are trying to modernize the plant-based meat movement, but they're really trying to satiate vegetarians. They're trying to create right. products that are almost like a consolation prize for the vegetarian in the group, as opposed to trying to appeal to meat consumers. Then right. you come to about five or so years ago and you start getting companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods who are really trying to make meat that is so convincing that even the most diehard inveterate meat consumer is going to want to eat it instead of meat. And you then have this industry popping up in 2016 where you have the first ever company formed to commercialize not plant-based meat, but actual real meat grown from animal cells rather than uh, coming from uh, the plant kingdom. And so okay. now there's more than a hundred of these companies that have been formed oh, wow. in the last few years. Some of them have raised hundreds of millions of dollars of venture capital funding. 
And so you have this race to try to recreate meat. And in the same way, if you think about fossil fuels, the problem is so bad, you want lots of alternatives. You want uh, wind, solar, geothermal, and more. Well, the problem of factory farming of animals is so serious that you want lots of options. So some people are using peas. Some people are doing it from wheat. Some people are doing it from soy. Some people are doing it from animal cells. Some people are doing it from fungi. There's all these ways that people are trying to recreate the meat experience without animals in the same way there's lots of ways to recreate energy without fossil fuels. Okay. And what way are you guys doing it? So at the Better Miko, we're extremely proud to be use, utilizing microbial fermentation in order to take microscopic fungi and subject them to a fermentation that creates a food that really looks like meat. So I'll give you an example, Dave. If you think about a cow eating grass, she eats grass for more than a year, and then you slaughter her, you get that steak. Well, what we do is we take little tiny microscopic fungi, and that, those are our cows, so to speak, and we feed them starchy foods like potatoes, and then they turn into something that looks very much like that same steak. The difference is that unlike the cow who takes more than a year and huge environmental resources to produce, our little microbes do it in less than one single day. So by the time we inoculate our fermenter to the time when we harvest the fermenter is less than 24 hours, less than 24 hours. That's how we can produce a huge amount of meat without the need to uh, do have so much of a burden on the planet. And our product, which we call Ryza, is a delicious meat type product that is all natural, that's a whole food, that has more protein than eggs, more iron than beef, and it is a delicious food that is makes a wonderful steak, a wonderful chicken cutlet, a wonderful crab cake and fish stick and more. And so in very little time, we can create these same meat experiences without the need to do so much damage. Is it then a substance that gets flavored or does it grow with its own flavor? Um, no, it does. It, it has a slight umami flavor, to be honest with you, Dave, but it isn't um, it doesn't have a flavor of its own for the most part. Really, for the most part, what you're dealing with is a substance that's extremely meat like and it's chewy texture like meat, but it can be flavored to make it taste like anything you want. And you're in production. This is for sale. People can go buy this right now. Uh, yeah, so we're partnered with Hormel Foods as an example, and okay. uh, we are we have built and are operating the largest mycoprotein fermentation facility in North America. So we're here in Sacramento, California, and we are running fermentations uh, all the time here. Every week, you can come by and see uh, how the meat gets made. Uh, slaughterhouses don't generally want you to come in to see how their meat gets made, but we are quite happy to show anybody who wants to see how our meat gets made or you don't want to come to Sacramento, just go to our website, which is bettermeat.co. Again, that's bettermeat.co. You can see for yourself just how the meat is made. Cool. And so how, people can buy it from anywhere they can buy Hormel uh, foods or, or how, does it, how does distribution work right now? Right. So we have this plant here that sells to Hormel and Hormel uses that ingredient in pilloting products that they want to release. Those products from Hormel are not on the market yet, um, but we're working toward that. So we want to build a full scale commercial facility that can make millions of pounds of our mycoprotein. Right now, we can only produce uh, hundreds or thousands of pounds, which is not enough for a company like Hormel. It's enough to do R&D. It's not enough to put things on thousands of okay. supermarket shelves. We do, however, sell to Purdue Farms for products that are called Purdue Chicken Plus. Purdue Chicken Plus is a half plant-based, half chicken nugget. And so that product is 50% uh, chicken, 50% plant-based. It's in 7,000 supermarkets, everywhere from Walmart to Target and more. And that contains better meat co-ingredients. And those are uh, a really great way to not only reduce your chicken consumption, but to increase your kids' vegetable consumption. So every serving of those nuggets contains a quarter cup of vegetables. And it doesn't look like vegetables. It tastes like vegetables. You can't see it at all. In fact, we're very proud to say the Food Network named it the best tasting frozen chicken nugget in America. So wow. think about that, Dave. The best tasting frozen chicken nugget is only 50% chicken. Just imagine if we could make all chicken nuggets like that, you would need billions of fewer chickens. And therefore, you could have huge number, uh, huge gains in the uh, reducing the amount of land needed that you need to farm. Tell me, t tell us all one more time. What what is that nugget called? Purdue Chicken Plus. And it's available easily, uh, readily available at Walmart and other other grocery stores. 
That's right. Fantastic. So this is, is that like the main way that listeners of my show uh, could consume your product right now? Or are you like shipping yeah. from your factory, like on, on ice or anything like that? Or Sadly, no, uh, we don't, um, we don't ship to individual consumers. We're an ingredients company. So we're not okay. going to have a, okay. a brand on, uh, on the shelf, but we sell to food companies like Hormel or Purdue okay. and so on. And then they use our ingredients in their products. Fantastic. Which is, is easier for us as a consumer. I mean, you have all these established nationwide brands. And so when you get your product in there, um, then it's very quickly and easily available. I imagine for you to go direct to the consumer uh, would be a whole lot harder and a lot longer slog. Uh, than yeah, we're doing. it's very tough to build a new food brand. It's not impossible, but it takes a ton of resources. What we are great at doing is running fermentations to create a meat experience without animals. We are not, uh, at least as of today, really thinking about trying to create a brand for consumers as much as we want to be that ingredient provider to empower all the other companies in this space to make much better alternative meats. And in fact, we'd like for them not to become alternative at all in the same way that right. I, I hope that solar will not be considered an alternative one day. I hope that our product will not be an alternative also. I love that. Do you happen to have ever read the book, The Marvelous Pigness of Pigs? No, but I'm eager to hear about it, Dave. I'm a huge fan of pigs. I love them. So I'm ready to hear. Tell me, what was it about? <laughs> uh, do you know Joel Salatin? He's a, I do. He's a, okay, he wrote it. Okay, I look forward to reading it. Okay, yeah, I highly recommend it. And cool. um, he is, uh, like yourself, uh, very interested in humane uh, treatment of, of animals. Now, he is on the farming side, right? So what he is shooting for is, is uh, simply... Uh, a shift from factory farming yeah. to supporting local farmers, which is probably a precursor to, you know, the long term step where companies like yours become the norm. And we no longer, you know, we look back on, on factory farming and think it, it was, you know, brutal and inhumane, probably. Right. Uh, uh, one day. But but he does um, he does really expose as you talked about chicken. This is what brought his book to mind for me, because. Um, I just don't think people are fully aware. I appreciate you not getting too, too kind of gross about the whole description of the meat industry because it really can be disgusting. It's terrible. The way you described how chickens are raised and, and you, you kind of sugarcoated it, honestly, and I know you did that on purpose. Right. Um, and the fact is that um, the way we raise these animals and if people could actually walk through some of these large factory farms and see just what happens... And then see that uh, these animals are so weakened. They have no immune system. Uh, the, the, there's people walking through there that look like astronauts. They're, they're decked out in like, you know, bacteria suits. They can't bring any bacteria into these places or it'll send like a, a disease through the place that would kill everything because these animals are just not normal. They, yeah. they don't they don't see the, the, the light of day in some cases yeah. uh, from incubation. And so it's. Yeah. Not, not only, Dave, I mean, so first of all, I'm in wholehearted agreement with you, but not only do they not see the light of day, but even if they were in pristine environments, even if they were out in a beautiful pasture, uh, the chickens who we use for food today have been selectively bred, again, to grow so big that many of them right. have trouble walking. I mean, right. they really are prisoners in their own bodies, like they are bred to suffer. And so it's not just the bad conditions in which they're kept. It's also the bad genetics that we have forced upon them that they're born into. And so I really believe that future generations are going to be in shock when they learn what we did to animals who we raised for food. Because it, think about it. We don't treat the worst criminals in our society the way that we treat farm animals. We don't think murderers and rapists and let's say put them inside of a cage so small where they can't even lift their arms or they can't turn around. Yet that is the norm in the pork yeah. and the egg industries. In the pork industry and the egg industry, they keep millions of animals in cages where they can barely move an inch their entire lives. They're not like a jail cell where they can walk around. I mean, their cages barely larger than the volume of these animals' bodies. It's like an iron yeah. maiden. And what do yeah. these animals do to deserve that type of punishment? Now, of course, they've committed no crime. Uh, the crime that they've committed is simply being born into the wrong species. And so I think future generations are going to look at that and they're going to think, how could we have ever tolerated such animal abuse? You know, we I think agree. of 
we think of animal abuse as you know somebody kicking their dog, which of course is terrible, but this is a more of an institutionalized routine and customary abuse where standard industry practices are so cruel that few people want to hear about them, let alone want to witness them. And I, I just am in constant uh, shock by how much these industries can do to inflict suffering on these animals uh, before society eventually says, hey, like, we can't stomach this. But I really believe that we will get to a point where the non-animal alternatives are equal in taste, equal in price, and equal in convenience. And at that point, who wouldn't want to switch? Who wouldn't want to say, yeah, there's a better way to do this? Pull out your crystal ball and uh, guess for us when that will be. <laughs> Well, I have, my, I've made many predictions that turn out totally false, Dave, so I, I will caveat it by saying my powers of prediction are quite bad, apparently. Uh, but I will say this. If you look at the trajectory of plant-based milk, oat milk, soy milk, almond milk, and so on, that has gone in the last 10 years from 1% of the fluid milk market to now 15% of the fluid milk okay. market. So plant-based meat today is less than 1% of the meat market. But imagine if within the next 10 years, it could go to 15%. That would be a really big advancement. And it would mean that we would need fewer animals and it would be a big shift in the diet. So I do think that there's a tipping point though, where you get to a certain point where there's enough scale that you reach price parity. And at that point, it starts happening much faster. The adoption rates really go up, uh, just like we're seeing, let's say, with solar and wind. So uh, I would say that in the next 10 years or so, I wouldn't expect alternative meat to be more than 10 to 15 percent of the market, which is still a very big jump from where it is today. Uh, but after that, I think you see a snowballing effect. And when there are alternatives, you'll see that people's ethical awakening will become very rapid because all of a sudden we no longer have the cognitive dissonance. Most people think yeah. I want meat. I don't want to hear about how it's made, but I, I, I want meat. So. Yeah. If there is, though, a way, j just in the same way, like who wouldn't want solar energy if it was cheaper than fossil fuel energy? Everybody right. would want it. And I think if the same comes true with meat, that if we have something that tastes the same and is actually more uh, economical, it, it, all of a sudden people are going to be horrified by what we do to animals because we're no longer so dependent on it. Now, you use the comparison of milk, which is really an interesting one, because um, and you've also used the word alternative several times. So like the milk industry, I guess no one really went out there and tried to take like the composition of milk, the cells of milk and produce milk outside of a cow. What they produced are all those things you mentioned, alternatives to milk, oat milk, soy milk, all these other types of thing. And, and uh, in a lot of cases, people prefer them and they are different than milk, but they're sold beside the milk. They have the word milk in them, right? Yeah. Is that the trajectory also of the meat industry? Will they all be alternatives or are there also going to be people who are trying to take meat cells and have the meat cells grow into meat? Yeah, they're doing both. So and interestingly enough, uh, there are several startups now who actually are producing milk without the cow, like real cow's milk without the cow. Oh, interesting. Uh, so they're, they're not widely commercially available, um, although, uh, interestingly enough, I actually ate one of their cream cheeses about an hour ago. So this is a company oh. called Perfect Day. And uh, it's a company that's existed for about seven years. And uh, through fermentation, they have actually uh, created real whey protein without cows. So it's a pretty interesting thing. It's not an alternative to whey protein. It is actual whey protein, but just created through fermentation rather than through actual living cows. So, uh, but that's not, you know, you're not going to, there's no milk on the market. There's like cream cheese or something like that, that you can get very selectively. But it's not like you can go buy a carton of, of this type of milk in the way that you can get right. coconut milk and soy milk and almond milk and oat milk and so on. Now, I do think that in the same way in the meat industry, yes, most of the products will be things that look and taste like animal meat, but aren't actually of animal origin. But there are a number of companies that are making real animal meat without the animals. One of them, which is called Eat Just, is selling its product in Singapore. So if you, Dave, go to Singapore right now, you can go buy Eat Just chicken nuggets, which are actual chicken cells uh, that have come from uh, one original donor chicken who was still living. 
and walking around and having a good life. So interesting. Uh, yeah. So what was sci-fi is now sci-fact. And uh, there are other companies in the U.S. that are eager to get their products onto the market. They're just waiting for regulatory approval here. Interesting. OK, so meantime, your product is a meat alternative. And so is it actually plant based? I know you said fungi, but I, I don't understand. Yeah, most people yeah. don't. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's interesting, Dave. So uh, let me just go back for like a very brief biology class lesson. So okay. That's you, got anim you got animals and you got plants, right? Yeah. Two different kingdoms on the evolutionary tree. You have a completely separate kingdom called fungi. Fungi are not plants. They're very far away from plants. In fact, fungi are not in the middle of animals and plants. They're right by animals. They're really close to animals. So just as a couple of examples, we all know plants photosynthesize. That's how they put themselves in the sun and that's how they get most of their energy. Well, fungi don't photosynthesize at all. Fungi, like animals, have to go out and hunt, you know, basically get their food and digest it and consume it. Uh, similarly, uh, we all know that plants breathe in CO2 and sequester it, and then they breathe out oxygen. Well, animals do the opposite. Animals breathe in oxygen and out CO2. That's what you and I are both doing right now. But fungi are so much more like plants that they breathe in oxygen also. They breathe out CO2. So that's just one ex or two examples, rather, of how much more like animals fungi are than are plants. So what we do at the Better Meat Co. is essentially take microscopic fungi. And these aren't mushrooms at all. They're what are called mycelium, which is like the root-like structure of a fungi that goes underneath the ground. Yeah. And we subject them to a special kind of fermentation where we take a process that would happen in nature on its own, wrap it in stainless steel, and let that fermentation take place. You walk into our facility, it looks like a beer brewery. And you then harvest them a day later where they now look like animal meat. And yet, unlike animal meat, not only do they have a tiny sliver of the resources needed to produce it, but they have no cholesterol, no saturated fat, high protein, high iron. It's a product that's just way better for us than animal meat. So it's better for animals. It's better for the planet. It's better for us. It's a real superfood. And that's why I think that products like this are going to be even more popular because you basically get all the benefits of meat that you want without so many of the downsides. Interesting. I actually had a mushroom expert on the show recently, Jeff Chilton. As a matter of fact, uh, he's been called the king of mushrooms. Uh, wow. He, he wow. actually That's brought the shiitake uh, mushroom into the United States in the 70s. Wow. Um, what, what a legacy. Jeez. He, he's exactly. a fascinating guy. Yeah. For those of you listening, you ought to listen to that episode um, because he goes into mycelium. This Everything you just brought up, he goes into depth on. He lives on Vancouver Island, which is like <laughs> one of the best places for mushrooms. Uh, yeah you know, uh, in North America. And, uh, and, and, and I'm very fascinated with this because um, it's mycelium and, and everything you're talking about. I mean, the, the nutritional value is amazing. It is. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. and you mentioned some of those benefits earlier on the show and some of the, the nutritional properties and maybe just recap that for a minute. So the, the nutritional properties of, of the food that you're, you're creating here. Sure. So it just as a basic primer, so if you think about mycelium, it's a catch-all term for what is like the, the root-like structure that goes underneath the ground that's uh, fungi. So um, just to back up even a little bit more, so most people, they think of fungi and they think of mushrooms as being synonymous, but they're not synonymous. So right. um, a mushroom is the fruiting body. It's like the reproductive organ of the fungus. And that's what you see above the ground. But underneath that, there's a whole network of mycelium underneath there. And interestingly enough, 90% of fungi don't ever produce mushrooms at all. They don't produce any mushrooms. And so you can use mycelium of something like a shiitake or an oyster mushroom, or you can use mycelium from other species that don't produce mushrooms at all, but they still produce mycelium. And so in the same way that if you think about plant proteins, there's lots of different species of plants that we can utilize. You can use pea protein, soy protein, wheat protein, chickpea protein, fava bean protein, like the list goes on and on of all these plant proteins. Similarly, there are thousands of fungi species from which you can select. And those fungi species each have different characteristics different protein contents, different growth rates, different textures, and so on. And what we at the Better Meat Co. have done is screened hundreds of strains of fungi to see what would produce the most economical, most proteinaceous, and um, most meat-like texture that we could find. Okay. And we have settled on a workhorse 
that really does a great job for us and it makes a delicious succulent meat experience without the need for animals and so mycelium is able to at least our mycelium is able to produce high protein and high iron unlike other unlike uh, plant foods it naturally contains vitamin b12 which is only found interesting in animal foods but it's yeah. in our mycelium naturally and it's a complete protein so some plant foods, like if you take wheat or pea, they're not complete proteins, meaning they don't have all nine essential amino acids in them, whereas our mycelium does. It does have all nine essential amino Interesting. acids. Interesting. Yeah. So we're very proud of the nutritional profile. It's a real powerhouse of an organism. And I think it could be the future of food for humanity because we are just, you know, right now killing ourselves the way that we produce protein. It's a horrible thing that we're doing by taking up so much land and water and greenhouse gas emissions and more. And so we need to find ways to replicate that meat experience that don't involve doing that. And using microbial fermentation, I think is a key way to do it. I love it. I love it. And I agree with everything you're saying. And I, and I, uh, I'm not a fan of factory farm. We, we still eat meat. Um, you know, I've, I've got some meat left in my freezer from me and me and a few friends have, there's a local farm, and uh, we we buy our farm from our meat from a local farmer uh, who raises it on a real farm, right? So I try not to support factory farming as much as I can, uh, but it's difficult. And companies like yours are going to make it easier uh, for all of us. Uh, it is a dilemma being a meat eater. It's hard to to once you understand these things. Yeah. But you want to eat meat. You're in a tough situation. I agree with you. It is tough because we're raised doing it. Uh, we have been, I mean, most of us, certainly I was raised eating meat every day. Um, yeah. And for a lot of people, especially in the United States, like a meal isn't a meal without meat. And right. in other parts of the world, like China and India and Brazil, where they're expanding their middle classes right now, they want to eat more like we in the United States do. Uh, you know, they, like, if you look at like in India and in China, where people have had not necessarily a vegetarian diet, but a way more plant-based diet, you know, based on either rice and beans or rice and vegetables. One of the first things that countries do when they start getting more money is eating more meat because they want to eat like we do. And so we, we should, of course, lead by example better by eating less meat and enjoying more plants. But at the same time, we also need to make sure that these other countries that I'm alluding to also don't end up eating the standard American diet, which is yeah. destroying the planet. So yeah. I, I think it, it certainly is tough. It's not, it's not an easy thing to do. Look, I would like, I think about it like this. There's lots of people who are happy to not drive and not fly and they're happy to bike and walk and so on. But most people are going to drive, they were going to fly. Similarly, there's a lot of people who are happy just not to eat meat and again, to eat lentil soup and rice and beans. And that's wonderful. That's awesome. I wish more people would do it. But a lot of people want to eat meat. They really do. It's a hard habit to break. And even if you haven't formed it, a lot of people want to. So I just think, you know, let's give people what they want. People want me. Got to keep it real. Like I, I, you know, it may not be good. I don't like it, but that's the hand that has been dealt. And so yeah. what can we do now that you take that fact and find ways to do it in a better way? Yeah, because scientifically we are omnivores from our canine teeth to the enzymes in our digestive system all the way through. We are designed to digest meat. It's just that in the past, uh, what you mentioned early on in the show about the way people eat meat and are, are kind of unmindful about how it was even harvested. I think of the Indians, native Indians, and the stories of how in ancient times, after the hunt, they would bless the animal. They would thank the animal. The hunters would, would, would spiritually, you know, have a ceremony to thanking the animal for what it did. And we've moved so far from that concept of really, really appreciating what we're doing when we, when we hunt or when we eat meat to being completely disconnected uh, from the entire process. Yeah, I, I think that we are disconnected. And I would go a little bit further even and say that the old ancient cultures, uh, surely like there weren't many vegan ancient cultures, okay? Uh, you right. know, people, people were hunter gatherers. Um, yep. But if you look at the diets of most hunter gatherers, not like the Inuit where they don't have vegetation growing, but most hunter gatherers who lived in temperate conditions, even those today, they don't eat a vegetarian diet, but they do eat a very low meat diet. So even the, the issue that you're bringing up about mindfulness, I think is a very important one. But again, I'd go a little bit further and say that most cultures and most tribes ate meat 
but not the type of quantities of meat that we eat today. Like we right. are eating so much meat and we know that eating uh, high amounts of meat is associated with increased risk of heart disease and colon cancer and other ailments that are really dangerous for us. It's not to say that, that eating any meat is, but eating a lot of meat is not good for us. And it's clear to me from looking at uh, the literature on this that we would be better off eating uh, far more plants and far fewer animals. At the same Agreed. time, I just think that, you know, <laughs> we got to do something. We got to find yeah. a way to, to give people that meat experience. Okay, well, Paul, I got one last question for you. This has been a terrific interview, very enlightening. I'm thrilled with what you guys are doing. I think you're helping us as a society move in the right direction. So I applaud your efforts. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank one you. One last question. This is a health show. And uh, what I found is everyone has a superpower. I'm a health coach. We have a, a group for our company. And, and, and every now and then I like to, you know, sometimes I come across as in our group, the coach giving all the answers. And sometimes I'll say, you know what? You guys all have a superpower somewhere. You, you, each of you know something more than I do in, in, in a variety of ways. And many times that's come through a mentor or a book or a tip or somewhere along the line, we got our own inspiration that really helped us improve our own health. And I'm wondering if you've had an experience or read a book or had a mentor or come across the right tip at the right time that helped you elevate your health in a significant way. And if you'd share that with us. I actually have a couple, Dave. So uh, first, I, um, I I run a lot, but I, uh, like in so many things in life, our barriers are oftentimes mentally self-imposed. And I really thought, look, I'm 42 years old. I'm not getting any faster, okay? Uh, and then I started hanging out with a friend of mine whose name is uh, Jed Silviz, and he's a really amazing athlete, great runner. And he started training me and got me down to now, uh, just this morning, I ran a 556 mile. And uh, for nice. me, you know, that's, nice. that's pretty good. You know, for me to run sure. 556 at, at age 42, I feel pretty good about it. Um, and so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm grateful to Jed who, for being a running mentor to me. However, uh, in addition to Jed, I'd say that when times get tough for me, uh, I usually do something. I'll tell Siri, call Tony, who is my wife, and then she will help me to be a good uh, partner to me and uh, and help me get through whatever adversity I am facing at the time. Uh, but the quote that I generally come back to think about and which I have on my wall in my home is a quote from the great philosopher known as Rocky Balboa, who said <laughs> that in life, it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. And that is how winning is done. And I think about that often because so often in life, we are presented with challenges and obstacles and adversity. And some people get knocked down and they stay down. Other people get knocked down or maybe they fall down of their own accord even and they stay down. Well, I want to be the type of person who, when I fall, whether I fall my own accord or I'm pushed, get back up and keep moving forward, just like Rocky Balboa. And so I'm grateful uh, for that advice from that sage philosopher. The great philosopher, Rocky Balboa. I love it. Well, Paul, thanks for, so much for sharing that and for everything else you shared with us on the show. I appreciate you taking the time and being here. And remind us one more time, people can experience your meat right now through the nugget called... Yes. So you can check out Purdue Chicken Plus, which is in Walmart and many other stores. And if you're interested in learning more about the Better Meat Co., you can go to our website, which is bettermeat.co. And if you're interested in reading my book, it's again, it's called Clean Meat. You can buy it anywhere books are sold, or you can go to the official book website, which is just cleanmeat.com. Fantastic. Thanks again, Paul, for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks so much, Dave. It's fun talking with you. Thank you. And for those of you listening, this is Dave Sherwin wishing you health and success.